on this Monday night, Kamala Harris seeks to unify Democrats. Their growing endorsements. She has been a strong leader on the national stage. And the millions in donations pouring in. Who could be her running mate? And the curveball thrown into Donald Trump's campaign. The Secret Service director grilled about the assassination attempt on Trump. I take full responsibility for any security lapse of our agency. Why she left lawmakers angry and without answers. Western Canada's wildfires, the evacuation orders, the air quality concerns, and what's fanning the flames. Plus teenagers drilling down at the lake. The unique summer camp for budding scientists. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Momentum is building behind Kamala Harris, the U.S. Vice President, who is now on track to be the Democrats' choice to run against Donald Trump in November's presidential election. 24 hours after President Joe Biden bowed out of the race and endorsed Harris, she is off and running, and Democrats are rapidly rallying behind her, as are donors. You can't run for president in the U.S. without having a multi-million dollar war chest, and she is getting the money and the endorsements. She told campaign workers tonight she is in it to win it. Jackson Prosco has our top story on how Kamala Harris is taking on the challenge of her life. It's Kamala Harris's party now as she goes from running mate to likely presidential nominee. It all happened within minutes of Joe Biden announcing he was dropping out. So in the days and weeks ahead, I together with you will do everything in my power to unite our Democratic Party, to unite our nation, and to win this election. Though Harris has pledged to earn and win her party's nomination, it already feels like a done deal. My sense is that the party knows what a, a perilous moment this is, and they will, they will fall into line behind her. In less than 24 hours, she raised over $80 million locking up key endorsements from Biden, the Clintons, and top-ranking Democrats like Nancy Pelosi. Vice President Kamala Harris has excited the community. She's excited the House Democratic Caucus. She inherits Biden's campaign infrastructure and met with her new campaign staff late Monday, where President Biden phoned in. I know yesterday's news is surprising and, uh, and it's hard for you to hear, but it was the right thing to do. Hundreds of Biden's delegates have already pledged their support. Speculation is turning to who she will choose as a running mate. Contenders include three governors, Pennsylvania's Josh Shapiro, Kentucky's Andy Bashir, and North Carolina's Roy Cooper, along with Arizona Senator Mark Kelly. Kamala Harris has to define herself as more moderate, run towards where the majority of the electorate is. And one way to do that is to pick a moderate Democratic governor. No longer despondent, Democrats are suddenly energized. While Donald Trump and his running mate have seen their hopes of running against Joe Biden vanish. Elite Democrats got in a smoke-filled room and decided to throw Joe Biden overboard. That is not how it works. That is a threat to democracy. Few Democrats seem upset about the change at the top of the ticket. Just two days ago, they had all but conceded the race to Trump. Suddenly, they're back in the fight. This just shakes everything up. It's a whole new race now. Jackson, Harris says she wants to earn the nomination, but is it really going to be a competition? Is anyone hinting they're going to run against her? Well, it's hard to see how it could be a competition at this point, Donna. Even if someone credible puts their name forward at this point, Harris has such a massive lead in fundraising and in pledged delegates at this point that it seems unlikely anyone would be able to overtake that. She has more than half of the pledged delegates she needs right now, and that more than $80 million, that is an all-time record for presidential fundraising in just 24 hours. That is a crazy amount of money. Jackson Prosco in Washington, thanks. Kamala Harris is 59 and from California, the daughter of a Jamaican father and Indian mother. She briefly went to high school in Montreal, got her law degree in the U.S., was elected San Francisco's district attorney in 2003 and a attorney general of California in 2010. In 2016, she became a California senator, and in 2020, she ran for president. But her campaign then didn't take off, and she withdrew. Joe Biden later picked her as his running mate. If she runs against Donald Trump and 
and beats him. She'd be the first female U.S. president, the first black woman, and the first Asian American in the Oval Office. There was a frank admission from the U.S. Secret Service today about that assassination attempt on Donald Trump at a rally in Pennsylvania. Kimberly Cheadle called it the most significant operational failure of the Secret Service in decades. But that's about all she said to a congressional committee that was expecting answers about how the gunman was able to climb unnoticed onto a roof and fire shots at Trump. Eric Sorensen reports. It's called a body bunker when Secret Service agents engulfed former President Trump putting their lives on the line. But it's what happened moments earlier that's in question, the failure to protect Trump before he was shot. On July 13th, we failed. Before Congress, the director of the Secret Service, Kimberly Cheadle, said she takes full responsibility for security lapses, but had few answers to key questions, like how did the shooter get so close? Can you answer why the Secret Service didn't place a single agent on the roof? We are still looking into the advanced process and the decisions right, that were right. made. OK, OK. It turns out the suspect was identified as suspicious before Trump took the stage, but was not seen as a threat. Did they confront him? Did they go up to him? Did they talk to him? I do not have those details at yeah, this that, time. Those are important details. There were a lot of answers like that with little new information. What we know is the gunman on a nearby building was about 125 meters from Donald Trump at the podium. The Secret Service director could not explain why that building was outside their security perimeter. The suspect was seen crawling on the roof by bystanders who called out to police to alert them two minutes before he fired. He fired on the roof. The gunman with a high-powered rifle took aim. Trump was shot. Then Secret Service snipers shot and killed the gunman. The question's not only why that building wasn't secured, but if there was a suspicious person, why did the rally go ahead? That's a threat right there. The guy's on the roof and everybody's yelling at him. Yes. The director said they're still combing through security communications in the critical minutes before the shooting. The people that are in charge of protecting the president on that day would never bring the former president out if there was a threat that had been identified. Cheadle said there will be accountability, but Republicans made it clear they want her held accountable right now. It is my firm belief, Director Cheadle, that you should resign. And after hours of testimony, the top Democrat agreed with them. This relationship is um, irretrievable at this point, and I think that uh, the director has lost the confidence of Congress. When the investigation is complete, Director Cheadle said she will have more answers. That's if she's still in charge. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. There is news about threats to politicians here in Canada. Two men in Alberta are facing charges accused of posting threats online, including against Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Mackenzie Gray is following this for us from Ottawa. Donna, they are disturbing charges that underscore the increasingly polarized political climate. The RCMP alleged that 67-year-old Gary Belzevic of Edmonton threatened on YouTube to kill the Prime Minister, Finance Minister Christian Freeland and NDP leader Jagmeet Singh leading to three charges of uttering threats. Mason John Baker, a 23-year-old from Calgary, was charged with the same offense in reference to an alleged tweet that also threatened to kill Justin Trudeau. Baker is scheduled to be in court on Tuesday. Belzevic's state is set for Thursday. Charges like this are relatively rare, but violent threats against MPs are not, with senior House of Commons staff saying harassment targeting MPs have jumped a whopping 800% in the past five years. One of the few other similar situations came back in 2017 in Saskatchewan. 40-year-old Derek Hurl received a two-year suspended sentence with conditions for posting this on Facebook. Quote, just want to take a gun to Justin Trudeau's head and blow his head off. It would be a service to Canada. There's no such thing as just an online threat. Everything that happens online is part of our real world. And what we're also seeing is that many of these online threats end up spilling over to real world threats. Now, those threats are likely to continue to change how politicians of all stripes interact with the public, Donna, ahead of a federal election that will happen in the next 15 months. Mackenzie in Ottawa, thank you. Israeli police say a Canadian citizen has been shot and killed near Israel's border with Gaza. They say he was threatening security forces with a knife not far from the Israeli village where 20 people were killed by Hamas militants on October 7th. The man reportedly entered Israel yesterday on a tourist visa. Redmond Shannon reports in a warning some of the video in his story is disturbing. 
the gates of the Netiv Ha'asara community in southern Israel. Three guards take aim and a man falls to the ground. Police say he was a Canadian citizen and was carrying this knife. This local politician said the security guards warned the man to stop before killing him. Local media say the man was yelling about the deaths of civilians in Gaza. It's also being reported he arrived in Israel on a tourist visa Sunday and rented a car. Was he on any lists? Who was aware of him? Um, has he traveled abroad in the past uh, as a foreign fighter? And, and has he returned? Is he a foreign fighter returnee? I mean, there are so many questions here. In a statement, Global Affairs Canada said it is aware of an incident involving a Canadian citizen in Israel and it is in contact with local authorities to gather additional information. It did not name the Canadian. Nativ Ha'asara sits right up against the northern wall of Gaza. Global News visited the community last fall after the October 7th attacks. They shot an RPG uh, into the house and the house got co uh, burned completely with the people inside. In all, 20 people were killed in Nativ Ha'asara. Some survivors have since returned. On the other side of the wall, the misery for Gazans goes on. Burials Monday for dozens of people killed in a series of Israeli attacks on Khan Yunus. Some of them very young children. This man says this is the blood of their children. It hasn't even dried yet. Israel has again ordered evacuations from the east of the city and from part of a nearby area that had been designated a safe zone. The Hamas-run health authority says the official death toll since October 7th has now reached 39,000 people and more than 89,000 wounded. Redmond Channel Global News, London. An Ontario man already facing murder charges has now been linked to the suicides of four people in New Zealand. Kenneth Law has been accused of sending so-called suicide packages around the world through an online mail order business. The 58-year-old is suspected in playing a role in the deaths of at least 129 people in 40 countries. Law is facing 14 counts of first-degree murder and 14 counts of aiding and abetting suicide. Across Western Canada, hundreds of wildfires are raging. B.C. and Alberta are dealing with nearly 500 fires and more than 200 of them are considered out of control. The situation is most serious in eastern B.C. and northern Alberta, where thousands of people have been forced to flee, as Heather Yorick's West reports. It's been a difficult few days for fire crews in the West. Driven by strong winds and high temperatures over the weekend, the Shetland Creek wildfire west of Kamloops forced the closure of the Trans-Canada Highway on Sunday. It's like an emotional roller coaster, right? It's like one minute I'm, we're, I'm laughing, it's up and down, up and down. Fires across much of the eastern part of British Columbia have triggered evacuation orders in 14 different communities. Another seven have been warned they too may soon need to pack up and go. Well, next door in Alberta, a fire near high level has forced 7,500 members of the Little Red River Cree First Nation from their homes. This is the first time in Little Red River Cree Nation history where we had to do a nationwide evacuation. And it's hard to sleep because I know some of our, some of our um, residents and memberships are, are still sleeping in vehicles waiting for accommodation. After a relatively cool June, a blazing hot July has made conditions perfect now for forests to burn with more strong winds in the days ahead. Given this heat and how dry our forest fuels are, um, you know, this, this wind event could really impact uh, any of the wildfires that are currently burning. That wind is also moving a lot of smoke, casting a haze over cities like Calgary and Saskatoon. Because it's so smoky in some of those areas, the smoke is taking the moisture out of the atmosphere and that inhibits the development of thunderstorms, of rain showers, so that continues that dry trend that we've been seeing now for several days. Temperatures are expected to drop into the 20s in much of the West heading into the weekend, but the reprieve will be temporary, with the mercury soaring back into the 30s before month's end. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. There is relief for some British Columbians tonight. Coming up, the people being allowed back home and how frighteningly close 
the fire came. There are still hundreds of fires burning in Western Canada, but people in Williams Lake, B.C. have been given a reprieve. They've been able to go back home after a fast-moving fire came dangerously close. Aaron MacArthur is in Williams Lake. Aaron. Donna, to say this was a close call is a bit of an understatement. Behind me is where the fire started Sunday night in a river valley, and this is as close as it got to Williams Lake. What's behind me there is a gas station. And while the fire is largely contained right now, it is still smoldering. The danger is still present, but it seems Williams Lake avoided what could have been catastrophic losses. The fire sparked in the river valley just before six Sunday night and quickly spread. Williams Lake firefighters jumped in to get a handle on the interface portion of this fire and BC Wildfire Service hit it from the air. Monday morning, the situation improved somewhat, but parts of the community remain on evacuation alert. There was a few uh, areas, flares uh, came up, but thank God, all those uh, first responders was on scene. They're uh, working on it and they had a good control. Evacuation orders, though, are in place for hundreds more people north of here in Barkerville and in the District of Wells and south of here between Spences Bridge and Ashcroft. The weather again expected to be hot Monday here in the central part of British Columbia. Their winds are expected. There is still the risk of thunderstorms. The concern for people living here only growing as this fire season unfolds. Donna. Aaron MacArthur in Williams Lake, BC, thanks. Everybody welcome back, continue to drive safe. A warm welcome back for residents of Labrador City. A wildfire evacuation order there was lifted this afternoon, allowing the town 7,000 people to go home. They were ordered to leave over a week ago after a sudden shift in weather pushed a fire close to the town. Loosening the leash ahead, Canadian dogs catch a break at the border. The U.S. is clarifying and simplifying its new rules on bringing dogs across the border from some countries, including Canada. The U.S. had proposed new measures it claimed were intended to keep rabies out of the country. Starting August 1st, dogs would have been required to be microchipped, vaccinated against rabies, and accompanied by two import forms signed by a veterinarian. The plans were criticized as overkill by dog owners, veterinarians, and tourism organizations, as well as Canada's government. Now, as long as dogs have been in low-risk or rabies-free countries for the last six months, they can cross the border with an import form that can be filled out on the day of travel. Canada's Food Inspection Agency has recalled a baby cereal from Calgary-based Baby Gourmet Foods. The recall is for its banana raisin oatmeal organic whole grain cereal over concerns of a possible chronobacter contamination. Chronobacter is a bacteria that can cause serious or fatal infections in the bloodstream, central nervous system and intestines. The company says no incidents related to the product have been reported. Next, the Canadian high school students getting summer down to a science. The eldest child of Prince William and Kate, the Princess of Wales, is celebrating his 11th birthday and the family has released a new photo of him. It was taken by his mother, Kate. It shows the prince looking dapper in a suit. George is second in line to the throne behind his father, Prince William. School's out for the summer, but not every student is taking a break from learning. A handful of budding scientists didn't want to miss the chance to study alongside scientists from around the world. It's part of a two-week science camp held just once a summer. Melissa Ridgen went to the world's freshwater laboratory, the Experimental Lakes area in northwestern Ontario, four hours east of Winnipeg, to check it out. First one's the hardest, so I'll be doing this one, but after it'll be a lot easier. To... They're looking for DNA. Absolutely. Can. You've collected water samples, rigged up a system to spin the water through a filter. It kind of looks like a forbidden egg, right? That goo will tell you what lives in the lake. Fold it in half. It's going to be a little bit fragile. How do you do that so like easily? With many years of practice. <laughs> Each July, eight students going into grade 12 are selected for the Experimental Lakes Area student experience. They get to learn alongside scientists and researchers right here at the world's freshwater laboratory. 
Manitoba and Northern Ontario students apply for these cherished spots and the recommendation of their science teachers. They're witnessing a bunch of programs with uh, scientists that are doing um, projects from around the world, essentially. And, uh, and they're working elbow to elbow with them um, throughout the week. Maybe they experience about six, seven different projects. It's been great. There's been a lot of direction, a lot of different people, uh, kind of learning how they got here in the first place. So some people knew right away in high school, some people didn't, and kind of just learning that you don't always know what to expect out here and kind of which direction it'll put you in for sciences. I like to know more about my environment, uh, and I just like getting outdoors in general. You want to do something in science when you're done school? Yes, I want to be a wildlife biologist. Well, then this makes perfect sense for you to come. Absolutely. <laughs> While they're learning alongside some of the best researchers in the world, it's not all work. After all, it is summer. Melissa Ridgen, Global News, the Experimental Lakes area, Ontario. And that is Global National for this Monday. These are difficult times in the news business, and our company is not immune. It has meant some difficult changes to our team, and one of the people leaving us is Mike Jolay, who has been a part of the Global National team for more than two decades. Check out this handsome guy. No, no, no. Look down. Over the last 21 years, Mike's main focus has been in and around Toronto, and he's done it all, from politics and crime to a whole lot of fun stories told with that special twist of Drolet's sense of humour. Mike has told hundreds of stories of people dealing with adversity from the war in Afghanistan, the earthquake in Haiti, and recently the hurricane in the Bahamas. Too much to sum up here, but we did want to take a moment to say thank you, Mike, for all of your hard work.